What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the You Know Ball podcast. Uh, I am here pretending like we didn't just have technical issues like we always do on this podcast. But uh, today I am excited to have back on my old friend, formerly of the 808s and Bars podcast, which we hosted a hip hop podcast for for all the old trill heads that know. Uh, we have Jason Buford from Pitchfork, Rolling Stone, Vice. He's everywhere nowadays. What's going on, Jason? Yo, what up? Uh, I watched Sixers Knicks on Sunday. I'm excited to talk some hoops. Let's get it. Yeah. So, so first off, before we get into some other stuff that that we know we're going to talk about, how was the vibe? How was the energy in the building at the Garden for the Sixers, a lot of Knicks Sixers team? fans? Yeah, a lot of Sixers fans. Which I, you know that doesn't surprise me because you know Philly and New York are not that far from each other. I'm sure people came down on the Amtrak or whatever. Um, or just a lot of Philly people live in New York and vice versa. And so um, I thought it was I, I thought it was a lot of energy, but a lot of Knicks fans, a lot of Sixers fans. I was going back and forth for a lot of Sixers fans in the section, so it was fun. <laughs> yeah. That's what we like to hear, folks. Yeah. Um, I, was like, I was like, a lot of the jokes were like Tobias. Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, well, you guys have your own Tobias. He's just... Uh... <laughs> yeah, we do have a yeah, guy. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, who's our well, Tobias? Julius Randle, come oh, on Randall, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, they both kind of had in outlier seasons for them last year. Julius was much better than Tobias. Yeah, but just yeah. generally speaking, they're very similar players in that yeah. regard. But I will say, like, I so I lived in New York for three and a half years. And when I lived there, um, I remember being so confused because – even when the Knicks were terrible, this was when the Knicks were really bad. Like they haven't been great this season, but these were some rough Knicks years. This was post mellow. This was uh, kind of in that area where they just were not doing well at all. And every Knicks game was still completely sold out. <laughs> you guys filled the fucking place all the time. And then across the river in Brooklyn, they just they struggle to get anyone despite being actually pretty good since they've moved to Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think like yeah, I mean it, it so one of the things that happened this year to the Knicks is I think the weight of expectations has hurt a lot of us, but at the same time, they're much worse than even the biggest skeptic was expecting. So you have a team that goes six in the East last year, whatever the six or fifth in the East last year. Yeah, you think you guys fourth, were fifth, fourth, something like that. Because yeah. we actually had gotten we we actually had home court against Atlanta, so I think we were fourth. And then um, this year now we're you know we're we're twenty four and thirty six or whatever the or, or whatever the record is. And I was expecting us to be a better team to have a worse record because the East was going to be better. But we've actually been worse than that. And so I think um, it's shocking that there's so energy around the team. Seriously. Like, it, it's shocking that the fans still care the way we do. So, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, even even with, like, everything that has happened with the team this year. And, and last time you were on the podcast, is funny, I – I re-listened to that episode and we were like, well, the Knicks are back. You know, it's the the, the garden. There's so much energy. Julius Randle's taking like, a we were like five and five and two at that point. Like we had started. No, 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 no. No, you were on the podcast. You were on the podcast last season. You have not even been on this year. So this was Oh, okay. This that was, was last the, season. Okay. I thought, yeah, I, don't know this, I thought it was like the beginning of this year. Okay, but well, last season. Okay. The end of last year, Julius Randle's in the middle of his all NBA season. Co- uh, Thibs is about to be coach of the year. Everything's great for the Knicks. And now, obviously, I, I kind of coming into the year, I had you guys as, I believe, the nine or the 10 seed. I definitely felt like you were going to be a little bit worse because I just felt there was going to be a regression uh, from last year. I felt like you guys overperformed last year. And I felt like, like you said, the East got a lot better. But, you know, all things considered, um, you know, it could be worse. I, I think a lot of the things with the Knicks this year is like they're not making the same major mistakes that they made before. They're not throwing the bag at at, at guys and, and and having a ton of terrible contracts on the book and, and chasing after stars to the point where it, you just can't build a normal team. Yeah. But – there has been that regression, and as you said, everything, everyone in the East taking a level up has has hurt the Knicks this year. But mm-hmm. I, I will say, just watching the game the other day, like I, I, 
from a Sixers fan perspective, I feel like the Knicks are really good at drafting role players. Like you guys are really good at getting guys the end of the first, beginning of the second. Like you guys are good. You're quickly, getting quickly seems to be like a solid role player, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, I think I unfortunately I think we'll eventually need to draft a guy or sign a guy who's like a bona fide star. And we don't really have anybody on the team that's that's close to being that. Yeah, exactly. And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later yeah. uh, in pursuit of a, a certain star that's out there that, that everyone has attached to the Knicks. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the Sixers signing mm-hmm. a former Nick, which seems like it's going to be inevitable sometime in the next day or two that once he clears waivers, DeAndre Jordan, who has been waived by the Los Angeles Lakers, will sign with the Sixers. Obviously, he has a relationship with Doc Rivers. He played with James Harden. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah with of the this, is why, this is why it's my nightmare. This is why yeah, yeah. in that video, I was like, I made the Willie Cauley Stein video, and I was like, please do not sign DeAndre Jordan. You cannot give Doc. Like, Doc is a lot like Tibbs. Tibbs and Doc are very similar. I mean, they both coach together in Boston. They have, they have their guys, own. and they want to keep yep. their guys into, into this kind of culture thing, and those guys are probably still stink, and it's like <laughs> – <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like yeah, yeah. you know, I I know Taj Gibson actually played pretty well for you guys last yeah, year, but like not bad actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And like, t- but like Taj is a, is a Thibs guy. Like if right, if right, Taj right. is healthy and 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 he's not a total disaster, he's gonna play. And like Doc has his guys. Last year it was Dwight. He will just. It does not matter how poorly Dwight is playing. Dwight's playing. That's all you need to know. Right. He gets his veteran guys and he gets attached to them. He did this. With, it, it, with the Clippers, with uh, guys like Montrez Harrell. Like, he just gets attached to certain players that he he really likes and, and feels like he trusts, which is something that I talked about with Jackson Frank on the last episode, mm-hmm. which is essentially that, like, Doc gets his guys he trusts, and he's really going to trust DeAndre Jordan because of their past relationship, him coaching him on the Clippers for all those which, years. I don't know why, because DeAndre Jordan used to have a lot of these bonehead mistakes late in the games for the Clippers in the playoffs. So, like, what do you actually trust about DeAndre Jordan? <laughs> he literally just threw the ball into the crowd the other night on a fast break (laughs) like he's a bozo sometimes dude and my whole thing about this and like you've had you've had some time you you were able to watch deandre jordan now three years ago when he played for the Knicks in the 2018 2019 season and he was looking washed then right yes yeah he was watched uh we had got him in the deal for brzingis and he's just like was not good at all uh, was yeah. clogging the paint, like wasn't giving any space for any drives to go through without a, a really good pick and roll guy too. He doesn't really a uh, 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 um without a, a a good pick and roll partner rather. He the one skill that he does have, which of his athleticism, is kind of gone anyway. Yeah, but without that, um, uh, even like as a threat, there's no nothing he can really do on the court. He's not great defensively. He's really undisciplined. Yeah, um, yeah. He just he can get a rebound. He can just get rebounds, but he's just like, yeah, he's not. Well, the Sixers do need help in that department, but also like y- you would hope that between the three or four, like the the Sixers' entire roster is about to be centers, other than James Harden and Tyrese Maxey. It feels like right now because. They already have, like, they just signed Willie Cully Stein to the 10-day contract. They'll probably waive him in order to create. And, like, I, you said it before, and I think I feel the same way. I'd rather just give Willie Cully Stein a shot because it's like, Willie Cully Stein is at least still young enough that I feel like he should be athletic enough to catch lobs and, like, play decent defense and, like, survive for 10 minutes as a backup center. Mm-hmm. And, like, if he doesn't work, you have Paul Reed, who can be more of a small ball five, and you have Charles Bassey, who is second in the NBA. And, like, once again, I said in that video about Willie Coley stein I predicted we were going to get DeAndre Jordan. I was yeah. like, that's who I thought they were going to get, and I was glad that they avoided that. But now it's like – I and as I said in that video, Paul Reed and Charles Bassey are not – like ready for big minutes in a playoff series. But once again, we're trying to survive the 10 minutes. How that- about, and this is what my issue with Tibbs is. Okay. You don't think they're ready for playoff series, but how about like, let's do that now. Let's try to put them right. in there now to get them ready for a playoff series. Instead That's of exactly doing, how I feel. Instead of going with this older veteran, who's like not good at all, who, yeah, maybe quote unquote is ready for a playoff series. 
but he's ready maybe like within his competitiveness, but not within any level of talent. Like ounce of he talent. might be ready for the retirement home more so yeah, than he yeah, is ready yeah. for a playoff yeah, series. Like, like to cheer yeah. on his teammates, but like <laughs> Yeah, you know like I mean? oh yeah, I've heard he's a great locker room guy. Okay, cool. We got we got a few of those. We got Tobias Harris and Matisse Thibel. Yeah. Like like I think that it's in Danny green. And it, and it's funny because it's like, I think that uh, generally speaking as a fan and as a person who watches the team, I know I even do it. We owe every team, every fan base overrates their young players, yeah. but I, but I just want them to get the opportunity to show that they can't play because yeah. if they get the same equal opportunities as the veteran bigs, as the Willie Cauley Steins, the Paul Millsaps, the DeAndre Jordans, and they prove that they cannot play, then fine. But so far this season, we've seen with Charles Bassey, like he played really good defense on Jokic. He's a good screen setter. He can run, he can, he can catch lobs. And one of the things that's so confusing to me about this is I don't know if you remember this, but last year, all I can remember with James Harden and DeAndre Jordan is all those clips going viral of him yelling at DeAndre Jordan. Yeah, because yeah. he wasn't in the right place and he wasn't making and i'm like how is this the guy that remember, they're like remember against i think it was against the spurs when jordan got the rebound but like it didn't go up with it because i think he thought like they were up one or like it was a tie game it was something like that and chris paul's like yelling i'm like go up with it go up with it. Like, you know? <laughs> i think he thought i think he thought Chris Paul didn't hit the hit the rim, and so I think he thought it was just like a shot clock thing. Mm. I was like, go up with it. Like, Paul's like yelling at him to go up with it. It's like one of the funniest things. <laughs> I can picture a lot of moments like that with James Harden once again. It's like, you know, it's yeah. these guys like Chris Paul, James Harden that are like very, like very straightforward about how they are as basketball players. They know what they want from their bigs. They know like, yeah. w- like where they need to be, what they need to do. And like, he's even James Harden's already started doing it here with the Sixers. Not even with the, oh. with the bigs. There was a, there was a moment in the, in Sunday's game where he looked at Embiid and gave him a head nod. And then after that, the game completely changed. They went to pick a ball and it was absolutely devastating. The Knicks. Yep. And to me, that was like, okay, we're taking over. It's it weird. Same play every single time down the floor. It was a pick and pop. The Knicks couldn't stop and beat for rolling to the paint. They were ended up fouling and beat or would be able to get an and one or uh Harden would go straight to the basket. It, it it was it was one of those performances that I was like, okay, now I see why they actually have a chance to win finally. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, no, that's how I feel too. It's it's weird because like I've just never felt like like Watching the game on Sunday when we and like by the way, I know the Sixers have kind of kicked the Knicks' ass over the last few years, but you guys always play us really tough. Like that's the one it's thing. It's always that, a pretty good game. Yeah, it's always yeah, a yeah, good yeah. Game. yeah. Like it's it's almost like going I, back to like TJ McConnell versus like Carmelo Anthony. Yes, right? yeah, so, yeah, exactly. The the recent history of the Sixers and Knicks have been some some really like good competitive games, and I remember watching that game and just being like, we're win we're winning this. Like it yeah. it, it it doesn't have a feel of like, oh no, they're going to blow the lead. Oh no, they're going to whatever. And I'm like, you have a steady hand that can write the ship in James Harden, an insane score playmaker passer. You have Joel and, and you call it the pick and roll. I call it, I I've said this on Twitter. I said this on the last podcast, we were calling it the pick and stroll because Joel doesn't really like, like I think about roll man and I'm like, like I'm thinking about like old Deandre Jordan, Blake Griffin, like, Guys who just like, boom, boom, get up, grab dunks, whatever. Clint Capella. These guys that are like, even like a Mitchell Robinson, like guys who are like vertical athletes that just like roll really smoothly. Joel just kind of pops his way down the lane and boop, in, yeah. or draws the foul. Like it, he's like, like he's I, so much bigger than everyone else on the floor too. Yeah. It's what I, it was what I noticed watching him live. This is the first, I think this is the first game I watched him beat live, which is why I really wanted to go. I didn't have a great seat. But um, watching watching players live, it's it's always good to see who's like so much bigger than the uh, other players on the floor. And Embiid is just so bigger than everyone else on the floor, and has such a center of gravity, and also has an ability to like understand his body well, though. And so like when he would get when when he would when he would get a dump off from Harden, it would be like just like one large step into the paint, and it's just unstoppable. Like yeah, exactly. And that's something that like. 
it's funny you say that. I, Bill Simmons always says that, like, you have to see players in person mm-hmm. in order to, like, really understand the impact that they have on games. Because you mm-hmm. can watch every game on television and not really understand, like, the command that a player, a star player, can have on a game. And earlier this year, Joel had that game against the Celtics that Bill was there in the front row watching when he took over in the fourth quarter and just absolutely dominated the rest of the game and the Sixers won. And one of the things that makes it like, and and part of the reason why I felt like there was no way that this combination was not going to like work because offensively it's like people are already bitching about it. There are videos going viral of all the free throw clips and all this shit and blah, blah, blah. But like, the um the level that the Sixers will get to the line, the level that the Sixers will get good shots out of possessions due to double teams on James Harden or Joel Embiid or just basically Tyrese Maxey working off ball or even like Tobias Harris who struggled to figure out his role so far with James Harden. Like, it feels like this offense is just no matter well, who... Tobias is struggling with his role because Tobias stinks. Tobias has been terrible this year. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 been undeniably bad. Should, be should be pretty easy to figure out, but he's just like, he, I mean, I was just like, leave him open. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a smart defensive strategy, yeah, like because yeah, yeah. it's a smart defensive strategy because it's like this guy is afraid to shoot yeah. in in big moments, which I will. Okay, and and everyone's been giving me shit in the Discord for this because I called him a good NBA player on the last episode. I just want to say, I know that Tobias Harris can be a good NBA player. There is a difference between being a good NBA player and having a role for you that makes you a good NBA player. Tobias yeah. can be a good player on a team like the Sixers last year that desperately needed a shot creation and when his shot was falling and all that stuff. But there's going to be a ceiling to that team. Because when you get to the playoffs, Tobias can't be a main initiator. And then also, now that he's fitting back into that role that he was when he first got to the Sixers, which was when we had Jimmy Butler, and he struggled to hit catch-and-shoot threes, and he was hesitant to shoot catch-and-shoot threes, and all that stuff. Now he's back in that role, and James Harden after the game was basically like, I told Tobias, I don't care if you miss 10 10 threes in a row, take the fucking shot every time. If you're open, you have to take the shot. So basically, right now, we need him to be... I love Harden. (laughs) I know. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, he he, he said the same thing to George Niang. Him and Embiid have similar energies, too. And I, that's why I always thought it would work is that him and Embiid are similar people in terms of it's just like you have to be confident in your game, like no matter what. Harden is such a confident player in his game, like has always been, no matter what. Like, and that may be that might have been his downfall some of those years in Houston because like he didn't adjust, but his not adjustment is this idea of like I am the best player on the floor at all times, kind of like, yeah. And those game seven and that game seven against the Warriors when he was in Houston. Yeah, whatever, like he was doing the same stuff he'd been doing all year, but that was what he does, those step back threes. So it's like, you know what I mean? Like that's just like how he plays. And so like it would make sense that he's just like, I don't care, you shoot it every time. You know what I mean? And so Right, yeah. And Joel Embiid and James Harden are good enough that they shouldn't have to adjust their games. I talk about this mm-hmm. a lot, which is essentially like you want to build around the weaknesses of your best players. You want to like, for example, Joel Embiid, not a great passer and playmaker. Okay, mm-hmm. so this season he's he's making he's made strides in that department. What you want to do then is you want to put the best possible spacing around Joel Embiid because if you don't have that, then you're getting into a, a situation where teams can easily double team him. They can frazzle him. He's not going to make the right passes. Blah 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 blah. James Harden, not the best defender, generally speaking, not the best defender, not the best working off the ball. Okay, so what do you do to cover that up? You start Matisse Thybul. You have Thybul take harder matchups. You have him play help defense. You do everything that you can to make James Harden's life easier on the defensive end. Obviously, you have Joel Embiid backing him up as well. I understand all all of that. Like, mm-hmm. but when it comes to guys like Tobias Harris, Ben Simmons, people who like are theoretically like, well, Ben is legitimately a good NBA player despite his flaws. But mm-hmm. like, but like Tobias specifically, like he is like we've seen him be good, but like he doesn't have role adjustment. Like Mm -hmm. it's, there isn't like a scalability factor to him on offense. If he's not going to catch and shoot threes and keep the ball moving and get how many times, I don't know if this happened in the Knicks game as much. I noticed it more in the Timberwolves game, but when he catches the ball and then he, instead of shooting the open three, he waits till the guy closes out. Then he, he dribbles into like the mid range. And then when the paint is clogged, because, because the defender rotates over, he just kicks it back out. 
Like, you're just resetting the possession over and over and over and over, and it fucks up the half-court offense, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I, I did – yeah, I mean, I I did note – I also noticed – I also noticed that, yeah, I noticed in the captain's shoot that he's he struggles. I also noticed that one of the biggest issues with him is he's not that not that athletic. And so yeah. when you have a more athletic guy on him, he can really struggle as well. Um, Especially and, a big athletic dude. It's big athletic, yeah. And presumably speaking, Tobias Harris as your fourth option is a good thing. But like you said, in the theory. Role, in theory, but the role Russell he seems to struggle with, yeah. So yeah, yeah. But but I will say the one thing, the one even if the results of these possessions weren't great, the one th- once again we're talking about Tobias, like he's our ninth man, but he is, he is what he is at this point. And the one thing I will say is I just went on Pound the Rock, which is one of my favorite NBA podcasts, and on there we were talking about so far Tobias Pound the Rock. Pound the Rock is uh, Cash and Wolfon from the score. They, sure. I'll send it to you. It's great. It's yeah, one yeah. of my favorite pods. But um, so basically, they um, he Joe uh, Joe uh, Cash was telling me that he, since James Harden has got there, it's only a two game sample. Obviously, Tobias yeah. Harris has taken his catch and point three points uh, from two point seven a game to 5.5 a game. So, like, okay. even if those shots aren't going in, he's at least taking them. And, like, at the end of that game, I, I have to give him a little bit of credit um, because he made a hustle play for a rebound at the end, and he he shot the corner three that iced the game, actually, towards, yeah. towards the end of that, that yeah, extended yeah, the lead. Yeah. And I just want to say, like, once again, we should expect this from a fucking max player. But... The reality is he is who he is. We're stuck with him for the rest of the season. And mm-hmm. he would not have done that before. He literally would just wouldn't have done like if he's not hitting shots, he's stopping shooting. And if he's not involved offensively, he's not hustling for rebounds and doing all that stuff. So the Sixers basically just I joked about it on that podcast. I said they need him to be Tobias Harrison Barnes. Like mm-hmm. they don't need him to be fucking diet mellow. They don't need yeah, him getting yeah. into his bullshit in the mid-range and doing all that stuff. Like, they need to make – he needs to do what Thibel and Maxi have done, which is realize their offensive limitations and – By the way, thrive. I love Maxi as a player. He's great. A fucking great. awesome. Maxie's yeah, and great. I yeah. I meant more so Thibel from he offense. Is, yeah, I mean, like, he's not like a perfect his, – his offensive bag isn't, like, perfect right now. Yeah, but like, still- there was a play, a turnover play, and I think Harden – Passed it to him, and Max is like falling down, and he catches it and like lays it up, and he's like on the ground, and I'm like, oh wow, Maxi is a dog. Like that yeah. is the type of play you make when you're like, I just like I, I I'm just like here to like I'm just here to win. Like you know what I mean? I'm just here to win. Yeah, it's just like a layup that you make when you're just like here to win. Yeah, Maxi's like kind of a dog. I I, I love. Him. Yeah, he is. He's he's really yeah. He's a winner. Like he's a yeah. he, he is that. It's a good way to put it. Like Tobias said, like he's like uh, we trust Maxi because he's a hooper. He just. He plays within the flow of the game. Like he adjust the adaptation from him so far in the yeah. first two games going. Like he's been working off the ball a lot this year, mm-hmm. but just to like know exactly where to be, when to shoot, when to attack closeouts, when to get downhill. And like when you take away, once again, Tobias and Maxi are very different as players because Maxi has realized having James Harden there can actually elevate my scoring, can actually make me a more efficient player, can make me a more effective player. And Tobias is now going to have to essentially adjust to that role and become more of a role player. And like Tobias is the fourth option, but like ideally with your fourth option, you want a guy like obviously better defensively, but like you want, you would rather have like George Niang as your fourth option because George Niang is going to shoot 10 catch and shoot threes a game. And he's going to do the things. And I talked about this earlier in the year. Like there was a point where like, I was like, should we just start Niang over Tobias? <laughs> like it's never going to happen, but just kind of like, fi- like, like doing what Maxi and Thibel have done so far, which is like working off of the gravity of James Harden which is like when everyone has their eyes on Harden or everyone has their eyes on Embiid, you better be moving around. You better be figuring out what open spots are on the court and you better be fucking scoring and, and trying to make quick decisions as best yeah, as possible. Yeah. Maxi makes plays. You know what I mean? He's just a guy who's just making plays out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's something that the six, I mean, I, it blows my mind because keep in mind, I mean, you know, the Knicks have not had a good point guard in forever. Just stuff the on six, Marbury, really. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
it's been forever since you guys have had a good point guard and have it going from, I, I, I can't remember. I think it was legs from Twitter, leg sanity who said that going from what the Sixers had to having James Harden as your point guard is like going from the bucks when they had Ryan Fitzpatrick and Jameis Winston and then you get fucking Tom Brady. Like, it's yeah. it's such a massive step up. And the Sixers now have gone from having no guards who could dribble, shoot, and pass to Tyrese Maxey and James Harden as their backcourt, which is just yeah. an absolute transformation. And, I, and, like, I don't know what the ceiling of this team is because I still am worried about, like, the four through eight is very much a problem. Like, very much thin and health and, but, like, Harden and Embiid as a one-two is probably as good as you're going to get in this league currently. Yeah, especially with injuries and yeah. everything that's going on it's right now. What Davis and LeBron were a few years ago for the Lakers, and that's really just how the Lakers won that title a few years ago. Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. Over, but like that, that's kind of how, and and also the, that Clippers team got hurt, and I think that Clippers team could have beat the Lakers, kind of, but. Um, did but, they get oh, hurt or was Doc their coach? Or, or Doc was the coach. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a brain um, injury halfway through the series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the Nuggets were able to. Uh, the Nuggets were unfortunately uh, able to come back against them, but like that yeah. Clippers team was 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 better than was beating the Lakers head to head in the regular season. But I think like, um, but yeah, I think. I think the one two of Dave of uh of Embiid and, and Harden is terrific. I mean, and just like the NBA playoffs is where your best two matters more than your best seven, kind of. True. So if you have the two best players on the floor, you got a chance. Even yeah. if you're not a more deeper team. So that's a good point. And I know people keep talking about that too, is like, you know, look at the last few titles, like the last even if you look at like the last ten years, mm -hmm. generally speaking, if your top two guys were performing at their best level even if you didn't have like the, I think the Bucks were running like a seven man rotation in the, in the finals last year. Like mm -hmm. they had like Pat Connaughton, who no one thought was good at all was like an important player mm -hmm. for them last year because they were just so top heavy with their yeah. top three guys. Well, Giannis top and Giannis and Middleton were better than the Suns is one too. Right. Well, exactly. Really just Giannis, really just yeah. Really just Giannis, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but Middleton hit big shots when they needed him yeah. to. And yeah. yeah. A and ultimately like th the Suns were the opposite of that, where like the Suns have two very good players. It's not even to like dismiss Chris Paul and uh, Devin Booker, who are fantastic players, but they were built a little bit more on being like an eight, nine man team. They were built a little bit more on depth. And Bridges is also a good player. They have a bunch awesome. of good players. Yeah, Aiton's yeah. great. Like they, like they, yeah. they're an awesome team. But, but just like generally speaking, they're not as top heavy. They're more like everyone knows their roles. They're good shooters, passers, uh, defenders, blah blah blah. But as you get deeper into the playoffs, like I've been thinking about the duos thing, and I'm like, okay, because I'm just taking LeBron and AD out, like because I'm just like, first off, and yes, part of it is the Russell Westbrook thing. But I've been going, like, this Lakers thing has been driving me fucking nuts, dude. Like, people are like, oh, I still wouldn't want to play that team in the playoffs. I'm like, I would. They suck. They're a bad team. I'm sorry, they are. Like, do do I want to play against LeBron James and Anthony Davis in the playoffs? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're bad. They're 11 and 10, even when those two play. They've beat no one good. And on top of that, like, oh, yeah, Russell... The, the Russell Westbrook thing's a disaster. They just got I know AD was out, but like AD's never healthy. This is a thing now. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I just don't understand. I, I just needed to do this little like tangent sidebar on the Lakers thing because I don't understand how anyone can feel that way having having watched the Lakers this year. Yeah, Lakers stink this year. Um, I mean, I actually had to call that before the season. I was like, I don't see it for the Lakers. I didn't think they'd be this bad, but I was like, Same. I, yeah. I was like, I don't see it for the Lakers. Like, I don't think they're gonna be. Good. I think I had them as like the six seed or something. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I was thinking of that too. I was like, I think they're like a six seed, seven seed. I don't think they're good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, to me, like you cannot rely on Anthony Davis to be healthy. The year they won a title was the outlier. Davis was healthy that year, like really good that year. Uh, but like that was the outlier. You know what I mean? Like you can't really rely on him to be healthy, unfortunately. Um, and the Bronx getting older, and Westbrook to me was it was always a weird fit to me. Westbrook's better on a team where he is 
dominating the ball and can like shoot you into the playoffs. So, like that Wizards team, for example, a few years ago. Of course. He got into the playoffs single handedly. That's what Westbrook is at this point in his career. He's not a guy who can be your number third option. And like for that, for that to really make sense in his game, kind of in his mentality. Yeah, and it clearly has not worked at all for them. And and yeah. I just think about like the best duos in the NBA with Paul George and Kawhi being out, with AD always being injured, and LeBron, as amazing as LeBron is, LeBron has not been a top five player this year. Like there's just like like I would easily take Jokic, uh, Embiid. Giannis, I had an Steph. argument about this with my hobies the other day. I was like, bro, Jokic is a top five player. Like, it was like, clearly, yeah, come on now. Yeah. Who else? Like, I'm like, who else? Like, I, I mean, I think my five would be the four I just named Steph, Giannis, Embiid, Jokic, and then I put KD in the five, I think. And then I'd probably have LeBron and Luka, and like maybe a little bit further down Harden, like depending on how he looks for the rest of this season, but like. He's yeah. looked hard. You you got to be excited about how good Harden's looked the past the past two games. Like I, I know, like Brooklyn fans were trying to say he was washed, but he wasn't really playing hard at the end of the at the end of them for them. You know what I mean? No, I mean it's pretty he, clear. <laughs> he looks really good. Yeah, he still looks like he can get to the paint. Um, maybe it doesn't quite look as uh, speedy and explosive as he did in Houston, but Harden's game was always about the balance. It was about the separation that he can get. He can still get separation really well. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing that makes me so excited about the pairing is, like, we legitimately have, like, even if you're lower on Harden, even if you're, like, yeah, he looks washed, he's whatever, like, at worst, he's, like, the 15th best player in the NBA. I would say higher. I would probably put him in the top 10 or 12 just based Mm -hmm. on, like, the body of work that we know that he's had. Like, you have Mm -hmm. to give some credit. Like, one of the reasons why I've always had Chris Paul a little bit higher than the general consensus is because I'm like, dude, Chris Paul's been doing this for, like, 15 years, and he's like, yeah, he's he's not... Chris Paul is in a wheelchair, I will assume he's going to be nice. (laughs) Same. (laughs) And, like, this is the first year I've ever had LeBron outside of the top five. And and, and, And most of that is due to the respect for his body of work and the fact that I think that he's, like, if not the best player of all time, the second best player of all time. And... I think that with this hearted and bead thing, like I, I, actually when I was on pound the rock, uh, J- cash was w- brought up this, this conspiracy that he had when Harden was traded to the Sixers and why he felt like they were the favorites in the East. And he said, look at the numbers from when Harden came back from his injury. He had a, so he had an injury in November. He came back in December and then he had like a month where he averaged like, 26 and 11 on like 60 percent true shooting and was like put up like five games of 30 plus triple double and blah 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 then the day that kd gets hurt and then the maury article comes out about him wanting to pursue him and you looked at his stats in the last games with brooklyn it was obvious he was phoning it in and like there was a stretch that showed like the old james harden is still in him right yeah and he's clearly showing that right now, which like, just like going back to the duos thing, I'm like, who else uh, other than Booker, CP, and then if Kyrie can play and KD is healthy, because there's just so many question marks. Chris Paul's hurt now. KD and Kyrie are like, who fucking knows if they're going to play again this year? Yeah. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard might not play again this year. LeBron, AD, who knows what the fuck's going on with him? Like, it feels like the Sixers might have the best duo in the NBA just based on availability alone. Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to think of any other team where I'm like, you put your top two up against them and like, you know, like like, no one else even has two top 15 players. You don't know if Kyrie can play at home in home games yet. And Brooklyn and and Durant's not healthy and Mm Simmons hasn't played a game yet. So yeah, like that, that is, that's the thing is those guys aren't healthy. Yep. And we could be heading towards a, and like respect to Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday, but like, I think they're more like top 25 guys, top 30 guys than like top 15 guys. And I think that maybe we could be headed to, it's possible we could get a first round Nets Sixers playoff series. Because if you look at the Sixers schedule and the next few games are going to tell us a lot about the Sixers in general, but if you look at the next few games, you go, the Sixers could get up to the two seed and the Nets are likely going to be a play-in team and they're likely going to get either the seven or the eight seed and they'll probably win that play-in game if KD's healthy. Mm. So 
the odds are in the favor of getting a Sixers Nets first round series, which would be fucking insane. That'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. Simmons cool. coming back to Philly. That'd be crazy. How do you feel? How do you think you guys match up with Miami? Because Miami's always the, they're always there, Miami. They're like uh, it's like life, death, taxes, Miami. Heat. Yeah, they're you always... can't get rid of them. They're so fucking yeah. annoying. Um, I actually feel kind of good about that matchup. I think their defense is a real fucking force. I think, but I think I, the one thing that does scare me a little bit about the Eastern Conference in general is there are a lot of very good defensive teams. Mm-hmm. The Bucks are very good defensively. If Brooke Lopez can come back, once again, another question mark. The Celtics have been fucking awesome defensively recently, and they just absolutely destroyed us. Now, that was before we got James Harden. Things have changed. Yeah. But Miami Heat defensively have been awesome, especially when their five guys are healthy. I'm Overall, I feel pretty good about a Heat matchup, though, because I look at the Heat and I go, who's going to be their crunch time guy? Like, they don't have – like. I know that Harden isn't like the greatest crunch time scorer, but they don't have someone who can shoot pass and dribble like James Harden in crunch time. Like Kyle Lowry's a great, a great player, but he's not a closer. Jimmy Butler. If you put a bigger guy on Jimmy Butler, he can be nullified a little bit because he can't shoot anymore. He can't shoot. Like he can get into his mid range and he can get like those closer shots. He's not shooting pull up threes. He's not shooting long twos. Like I think that, Ultimately, in crunch time, unless it's like Tyler Hero takes some crazy leap over the next few weeks to months, like I don't really see them like in close playoff games having a guy that they can go to and rely on down the stretch like the Sixers can with Embiid and Harden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see that either. I mean, just Embiid and Harden, that is like, yeah, that is like a headlock. (laughs) Yeah. It really is. I mean, if they're healthy, it's it's it, that's like yeah. And their games, yeah. their games complement each other really well. You know what I mean? Like, it didn't take, it didn't take a lot of gelling and adjusting. You know, it was just very, it was very natural from what I saw on Sunday. So, I'm excited. Yeah, and, to watch. yeah same like, here. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that that's the thing is that I talked about before is like Harden has proven himself to be very adaptable to like every situation mm-hmm. that he's gone into. He gets a lot of shit because of the Houston years, but like by the end of the Houston years, he didn't want to play like that yeah. anymore. Yeah. Also, said- also like they were. I mean, the him and the him and the him and Chris Paul had their like little. Uh, yeah, him and Chris Paul had their little beef. tussle by the yeah had a little beef at the end, and like so I, I guess so did him and Westbrook too, but like. I don't know. For me personally, when I was always watching those Houston teams, I was never blaming Harden for it. Like, I mean, there were there are things about Harden as a player that, I mean, I, I've always been a fan of Harden in this game. I always thought he was like kind of an offensive wizard, this genius of a player. His ability to see the game ahead and his balance and, and, and things of that nature. But like, I do agree that I used to do, I do, I do, I do I, he's not a perfect player, right? Like, he's not a perfect two guard. But um, I never blamed him for like Houston's issues. Houston's issues that their roster wasn't that well like founded, really. It and even and and the one year that it was, they could have won the title if Chris Paul doesn't get hurt. Title. Right? Yeah, like if, which if, if 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 bounces get better, like if they get more lucky bounces, they win that game against Golden yeah. State. And and they they crush the Cavs in the finals probably. And and it is worth noting that like you know the few times that Harden did have a good roster with a, a legit second star and Chris Paul built around him that they were unbelievable when Chris, Clint Capella Chris Paul I gotta look up this stat right now because I I, ne- I never look up stats on the podcast but in that 2017-2018 season when it was Chris Paul Harden and uh it was Harden Chris Paul and Clint Capella when they all played together it was like the most insane record I think I've ever heard hold on Let's see, uh, what they were 50 and five in the 55 games that Clint Capella, James Harden, and uh, they were 75 and 16 in two seasons together in Houston during that time. Mm-hmm. So, like, I think the regular, and I'm trying not to get too caught up on two games against the Timberwolves, who are a solid playoff team this year, but they're not contenders, and the Knicks, mm-hmm. who are, are having you know, a uh, a regression season right now. I'm trying not to get too caught up on this sample size of two games, but you've seen the flashes and like, I need to see them go up. Funny enough, you brought up Miami. I want to see them against Miami first. 
And I want to see them against, I think the only teams they have left on their schedule that could challenge them are like Miami, Chicago. And then I think they might have some teams in the West Coast, like the Nuggets or something. But like, there's only like a handful of teams that I feel like defensively would be able to have multiple guys. Miami might be one of them, to be honest. And like the Celtics don't have individual defenders that can that can uh, guard Embiid, but they play really good team defense against Embiid. Mm-hmm. And they might have the on-ball guys in uh, Derek White and Marcus Smart to slow down James Harden. Where like that matchup I'm not crazy about, even though I think the Sixers have the two best players in the series. And mm-hmm. that, once again, ultimately might just decide what like, I mean, and and I, I think that, like, you can't wish for matchups. Because if you're really good enough, you do what the Bucks did last year. Do you remember at the end of the season last year when everyone was criticizing the Bucks because they had a chance to play against – I think they had a chance to play against you guys in the first round if they lost – or the Hawks, one of them. They could have played against the Hawks one in the them. Knicks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Down the stretch of the season, if they had just thrown the game against Miami and they would have – Instead of getting Miami in the first round, we're like, what are they doing? Oh, my God. And then they went to into Miami and they kicked their fucking ass and yeah, swept yeah. them in four games. And I guess my hold up with Miami and, like, this whole thing is, like, I'm just, like, okay, so this is a team that got swept in the first round last year. And then they added – Miami got swept by Milwaukee in the first round last year? Correct. And they were healthy. They did not – Bam played. Jimmy played. Like right, the, yeah. that team was not as good because, you know, Goran Dragic had fell off a cliff mm-hmm. and their depth was really bad. And like they went out and they got some nice guys for that this year. Like PJ Tucker's great. They fucking, uh, you know, Spo went to his closet and found another white shooter in uh, Max Struess. And they figured this shit out in a way like and they're a very good regular season team. But my my biggest question mark with teams like Miami and Boston is like more so Miami than Boston is like, is Miami really did they go from getting swept in the first round last year to adding Kyle Lowry and PJ Tucker? And now they're a finals team. Because that feels like a massive leap to me. It feels like a massive leap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It feels like it, it feels like the thing you do. It, it feels like something you predict when you're like on cocaine. And you're high off the ladder. <laughs> well, Pat Riley, it, perfect for that. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna make it, bro. It's like ah, I don't know. <laughs> we got this. Yeah, Jimmy and Jimmy yeah, and yeah. Pat down there. I, and like, look, man. Like maybe Kyle Lowry and PJ Tucker really. I mean, they're very good players. Like maybe they just do make Lowry's that much a really of a good difference. Player. Yeah, yeah. He is. He and is. Bam and Hero have got and Hero have gotten better. So like I and like Hero had a down last year, down year last year. Jimmy even in the playoffs really sucked last year. So like I don't think they're going to be a first round out or anything. But I do have a hard time believing that like the difference between them getting swept in the first round by the Bucks and then making it to the finals is like a step up from those two guys and then getting Kyle Lowry and PJ Tucker. Maybe I'm yeah. wrong. Maybe maybe Miami yeah. will prove me wrong. Maybe they'll just get to the playoffs and be like, we really I mean, are this good. Before. It's happened before yeah. them getting into the finals, and I was like, I didn't think, I don't think this team. You know I, mean, I mean, the like, bubble, yeah, the bubble is a perfect example bubble, of like, I yeah. didn't, yeah, I didn't think that team was nearly good enough to be a finals team, and and they they and they took the Lakers to six but without. The bubble was like such a weird time for everything. I know. Yeah, it's like yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. Goran Dragic and, and Tyler Hero played like all stars, and Duncan Robinson couldn't miss, and Jake, yeah. like. Like, uh, I think Jim Crowder, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, there, there was so much shit. Fuck, TJ so Warren much happening in the bubble that was like didn't make any sense. TJ Warren turned into tall Michael Jordan. Uh, yeah. like it was weird, a very weird, just like fucking experience in general. And I think that the Heat really benefited from that. I think they're somewhere in between where they were in the bubble and what they are and what they were last year. We're like, they're not a finals team, but they're also not like we're going to get swept in the first round. Like, I think they're probably a second round team, maybe at best a conference finals team, but it just does feel like the, like I know it, somehow the East feels super loaded one through seven. And then at the same time, I'm like, but everyone's injured, but all these question marks yeah. are out there and it feels wide open at the same time. Boston's been a lot better than I thought they were going to be. Um, but still not really a contender to me. They're built on defense, and yeah. I do wonder if their defense is good enough to carry them in the play. Like, 
they are Tatum's a t- Tatum is a scorer though. Tatum is a really good. That's scorer. what I'm saying. Yeah. Is that like if, t- if they are a Tatum and Jalen Brown hot streak away from making a run? That's yeah. that is what what their like upside is, I guess, because we know the defense is going to be good because they have the number one defense in the NBA right now. We knew that that was that that, that, that will be sustainable, but I guess this year will determine a little bit just about like the last few champions have actually been kind of built around defense. If you think about it, like they had good offenses, but like the bucks, the Raptors, like, is this, is there a shift happening in the NBA right now where like teams are being more defensive focused or is it just going to be like, and the Warriors have a very good defense too. But like, I think that like having Steph Curry means you're going to have an absolutely elite offense and like, Oh, Is it going to be the Warriors or the Suns or the Sixers where these teams are weirdly enough, the Sixers are probably the most and and the Nets, the Nets are obviously the most offensive minded team in the Eastern conference, but it seems like the Warriors and the Nets are going, or I'm sorry, the Sixers and the Nets in the East are going to be the, the offensive teams, whereas everyone else's identity is built around defense, generally speaking. And I don't really take the Cavs and the, and the Bulls that seriously. I just don't like, I just don't think that they're contenders. No. Yeah, they're not, they're not, they're not. Yeah. And like the like the great year well, for sure. The Bulls' is problem, the Bulls are another team that's like not healthy. If they had Lonzo and Caruso, I would think a little bit better about them, to be honest. Yeah. But they've uh, been hurt all year. They've been hurt all year, yeah. And then Chicago and then Chicago, as good as as good as Damar has been, and I love to see a good redemption story. Vooch's defense in the playoffs is going to get fucking burnt unless yeah. unless they have Lonzo and Caruso playing I mean, and they're I made both healthy. That bet with Kevin because I thought that Vucevic's defense was awful. It was going to like hurt them in the regular season, and it yeah. has recently. But it just it took a while. But it took Caruso and Lonzo getting hurt for it to mm-hmm. like really hurt. And then like you know like I love Levine, but like to me like I just look at the Bulls and I'm like I think they're like two and eleven against. Uh, teams above five hundred. They beat up on the team that they should be beating, and that's yeah. what and that's what happens when you have guys like DeRozan and Levine who just like are there, who are just scores every night. They're just like, okay, we're winning this game against like yeah. bad teams, but against the good teams, it's hard for them to like reach another like level talent wise. I think, especially DeRozan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and like I, we'll see. I mean, DeRoz- the one thing I will say about DeRozan, and I don't want to get tricked by regular season stuff again with him, but the he's the, a better player than he was in Toronto. Yes. Though. Yes. Yes. But, and also, like, that mid range game, like, it just feels unstoppable sometimes. Like, it's just automatic, dude. Like, I I was saying the other day, like, I feel like when Tyrese Maxey Maxey catches and shoots, it's, it's like automatic. He's shooting like 60% from there. DeMar shooting like 53% or something on high volume in the mid range. And in the clutch, he's like, the best clutch scorer in the NBA, which I think might be transferable to the playoffs, but we'll see when he has, like, all the defense's attention on him. And, like, once again, the East is built around a lot of really good elite defenders. So, like, it's possible that he gets to the playoffs and just kind of falls flat on his face again. But let's just let's just um, talk a little bit about, in this second game of the Knicks and Sixers, let's, let's wrap up talking about that. Uh, and then we'll talk about the Knicks for a little bit. So, in the second half of the second game of the Knicks and Sixers, uh, <laughs> what are you looking for other than... Um, Jericho Sims and Mitchell Robinson not fouling out. Cause like that's one competitive advantage I haven't even thought about with the Harden and Bead Sixers is like they might just foul out the other team's best. But like if Bam Adebayo is guarding Joel and Bead in a Heat series, like he might just not be able to stay on the court because he can't yeah. not foul him. <laughs> Which to me, it seems like, um, it seems like the, the Knicks, e- e- Jericho Sims actually, but once again, Knicks drafting good role players. I think Jericho Sims, Sims, like he's a, yeah, Sims is like he's he showed some player. moments. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, like I like Miles McBride. I like Quentin Grimes. Like I I like, I like Grimes what too. you guys I like. Grimes too. Yeah, yeah. Grimes, but like I think is the one of the Grimes, I think has a chance to be a little bit better than just a role guy. For but, sure, I think he could be like a fifth starter type guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll yeah, I, I I like I'm bullish on Grimes. He, he right away he could shoot the three. He can and he could dribble and penetrate really well and like at effort, effortlessly as well as well. Um, but, but quick OB, um, yeah, quick OB Sims, um, oh, RJ's been killing it recently. I mean, not, not a role player necessarily, but RJ's been Here's looking the thing a lot better. RJ, and I, I was talking to this about with, uh, Andrew Quo from Cookie Hoops. Here's the thing about RJ that I'm worried about. So 
he's at his best when he's going downhill. Mm-hmm. But he can't hit free throws. Which right. is like that, which is like whatever. That can next year I mean, he might hit seventy five percent. He's a guy who like, gets into the gym and like you know what I mean. He's a worker. Yeah, yeah. But he's at his best when he's going downhill. He's not. But he's not a. He'll probably never really be a good shooter. I mean, he'll probably never be a really consistent shooter. Um, especially off the dribble. Ooh, I didn't realize that he's shooting sixty eight percent from the line this season. Yeah. No. 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 It's not good. It's not good. Yeah. It's not good. That's his career like, average. Guy too. Who's like at his best when he's going downhill and getting fouled, and like that's really yeah. where he's like really good. Um, it's 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 a little bit of a struggle. He's just an average scorer. He's just an average volume scorer, and I think ideally he is a good volume scorer on your team. Yeah, but he's just average at it, and so that's what I'm kind of worried about. And he's still young, but I don't know if I just don't see him ever being like a like dribble pull up type of guy. I always see him being a downhill type of player. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like from John Wall. John Wall was six six on the lefty. Like you know what I mean? Just I always or or and not a point guard. And and I always just see him like being <laughs> not, as like, athletic. not as athletic. Not as athletic. Not yeah. I mean I just see him being this downhill not a Hall of Famer, not an all star. <laughs> not an all star. Well I mean he, I, I can see him making like one or two. But like I yeah I just see him as this like downhill slasher. Um so yeah, yeah. I mean, my my thing with with the Knicks is that like you guys have been searching for yeah. this one star, as we said. Like you guys have been fishing for stars for for so long, and, and and you know I like the Kemba move. I like the idea on buying low on him, bringing him home, seeing his like, knees look, aren't healthy. His knees aren't healthy. Right, he's cooked, but. You signed him to a two-year deal for, like, $17 million or yeah. whatever. Like, you took the shot. If Kemba is even – ever gets back to the form that he could that he did for, like, two weeks this season. Um, well, that mean, was when he gets, like, a healthy break for, like, 10 games, he comes back, like, on fire. Because right. he's a really good player. Like, <laughs> like he's so, he just like, can't never, stay healthy. Yeah, he just can't. He just his knees just like can't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really sad to see because it was a really cool story to have him come home and play at the Garden, and you know after he hit that iconic shot like 11, 12 years ago at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but but just kind of like one of the things I feel like watching the Knicks is like last year they felt like a really disciplined team. Like it felt like they were good defensively. They didn't like, but one of the things is like, you know, obviously it's very hard to guard Joel Embiid and James Harden. I'm going to give them a break in that regard when it comes to like the fouling and stuff, but it did feel like the other day there was a lot, it was not very like, not a very Tibbs team kind of. And, and so like what's been going on with your issues that you have with Tibbs this year, because we've talked about him being kind of boomerish and him kind of having his guys and doing his things and being stubborn and not changing. So like, what's been, what's your deal with Thibs this season? And like, are you, are you over the Thibs experience? I'm over it. So here's two things. Here's the two things that are my issues and I am over it. Okay. Here's the first thing. And this is where, look, shout out to, look, Shout out to the homies at, at, at anywhere who are, you know, saying that it's not all on Tibbs. It's like the players and blah, blah, blah. Because there are people out there that are like, I'm not even going to name them, but there are people out there that have been that have been saying like on Twitter or, or, or like Wolves fans who still like, there's like a, there's like one every 10 Wolves fan that still like loves Tibbs. It's weird. And then like Tibbs, Tib, Bulls fans who still love Tibbs. Well, to like, be fair, he got them to the playoffs for the first time in like, 20 true, years true. so yeah. and then, like bulls fans who like love tibbs um are like oh like big fans are going crazy what, what do we all want of course so sh- shout out to y'all no disrespect but like y'all are fucking bugging okay here's the thing <laughs> here's the thing yes our roster is not that good yes julius yeah i mean like julius randall is our quote-unquote best player like that's not great you know what i mean like if you look down down a lot on nba teams randall being your best player I mean, he might be like that's like towards the bottom, right? Honestly, sure. it really is. Honestly, towards the bottom in terms of like, oh, Randall's our best player. That's honestly towards the bottom, except for the obviously tanking teams. Yes, except for the obviously tanking teams. But like, even a team like the Pelicans, Ingram's better than Randall. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, our problems are exasperated. 
by a coach who is too stubborn to make any different type of changes. Alec, there is no reason for Alec Burton to be playing 36 minutes a game. No reason. It's insane. It's insane. It doesn't make any sense. He's a six man. He's a six man. He's never been a starting point guard in his life. It doesn't make any sense to have this. Put quickly at the point. See what you can finally do. With quickly at the point. With no, like, this is your job now, quick. See what you can do. Don't change his role. Just see what he can do there. Put McBride in there. See what he can do. Alex Brooks should not be playing 36 minutes. It doesn't make any sense. No. It makes no sense. Especially in the middle of a lost season. Like, at this point, we can we can determine that the, the Knicks are not, are not making, making the playoffs. They're not Come making on. the play in. They're not, like, this, this season, like, now at this point, best case scenario would be the 10 seed. At that point, you might as well just lean a little bit into like developing young guys. And like, I'm not even saying you have to tank, but like, you're just going to be bad anyway. So you might as well see what you have in those guys. And that is one of the things like, I actually think that Tibbs, like last year to me, Tibbs, that was like an all-time coaching job. That roster was not a four seed roster. We all know it. Like that was definitely better than what a, a tr- traditional four seed is in terms of like a co- he co- he coached up this season the regression plus I, I my biggest thing with like the roster thing is like it was this massive overcorrection right mm-hmm. you guys got it in the playoffs you guys went up against Trey Young who we know Trey he killed the Sixers he killed the Knicks like we were both defensive minded teams you know, we didn't have that offensive initiator. We didn't have enough shot creation. We didn't have all these things. And instead of kind of building around your identity and kind of, I don't even want to say doubling down, but like kind of like building on the margins and making sure that you're better at the things that you could be better at. The Knicks reaction was let's sign a bunch of veteran shot creators who all need the ball. Yes. So, so yes. you get, Evan I mean, Fournier, so I don't actually, actually, Kemba so Walker, Fournier's bring back right. Burks and and Fournier's and Rose been all right in the second half. Fournier, Fournier for the Fournier first, is a fine player. Yeah, for the first six weeks, Fournier was really struggling, and he's actually been kind of fine, like solid the past like I want to say like two months or whatever. Um, yeah, since January, Fournier has been fine, kind of. It, I think it, he's it, a fine like fifth starter type. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hate Fournier the way I did in the beginning of the regular season. To me, and I think Fournier and Randall have a decent two man game that they can do. I just, yeah, I, I just think that the coach is the most stubborn person on the planet and would rather be stubborn and lose than like maybe try something different. Like Obi and Randall at the same time with Reddish as well was troubling for the Sixers because there was an athleticism that was on the floor that they struggled with. You saw that. It was yeah, like, no, you guys, when you guys play the young guys, I will say yeah. when you guys play the young guys, it's good results. The the lineup I think was a like quick for reddish quick Barrett. Uh, like reddish. Uh, Randall and, o- and Obi, I think that was, the yeah. Towards, like that. Yeah. Something like that. Like in the third quarter, and like Philly was having trouble with it. They were like, oh, over the place on so defense. They were long. They were athletic. They were running down the floor. Quick was wreaking havoc. Like the quick, quick struggles when the jump shot isn't going well. When the jump shot's well, he's good. Um, he can just struggle when the jump shot's not well because he's not really a good finisher. So it's like, what is he really doing? But when the jump shot's going, he plays well. Um, because he's trying out there, and so like. Why I don't understand why he's not trying to mix and match with that more, trying to play them more, um, you know, trying to play reddish more. I, I just like these are good results when this happens, and then he'll go back with Burks and Randall and uh, uh, Fournier, and it's like ball stoppers. You're you're, yeah, you're just you're full of same, ball stoppers. You're full of ball stoppers. You're doing the same thing over and over again. Randall's good when he is. Um, making quick decisions, and uh, he's pushing the ball up and down the floor. He's not good when he's going iso mellow. Right. That and play, he, okay, he, in he, the he, in he, the, he, yeah. the Sixers-Knicks game with the the worst shot selection I've maybe ever seen uh, if, if, from that game, it, just from a player in general, you get 
so since the Sixers have gotten James Harden, they're going to have to switch more. That's just kind of how having James Harden works. And one of the downfalls of his game might be that. Mm -hmm. But when the advantage is as an offense, when you get a switch, like Julius Randle got a switch onto Tyrese Maxey, who's six foot three, (laughs) and maybe on a good day, he's more like six foot one. And Randle takes the ball. Instead of trying to get downhill, instead of trying to post him up, instead of trying to do whatever, he takes one step inside the three-point line, tries to shake him, can't shake him, and takes a contested long two yeah. over a six-foot guy. Like, it's just not – it's not going to be – like, last year the offense was workable, and, like, it, it could work in the regular yeah, season. Yeah, I mean, Randall, like, Randall shot, like, Dirk Nowitzki last year. And so, like, yes. clearly, like, obviously he's not that. But he is better than what he showed this year so far, like, a little bit. You know he mean? was better two years ago with you, or three years ago, whatever that was, with you guys. With uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or with you guys, even in his first season, he had a little, like, he was a little bit more efficient, and, like, his passing wasn't as good, but, like, he he had his moments where he wasn't, like, he's been pretty bad at times this year. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's been pretty bad. And, yeah, it, it, it what I also realized is everyone calls him, all calls him just disciplined coach, just hard coach, hard coach to play for you know, demands a lot out of his players. To me, that's not really true. Not from what I see. To me, what's going on is certain players have this leeway to do whatever, and certain players don't. So vets. So vets. That's bullshit to me. Yeah, Either I agree. You're actually a, a, a hard-nosed coach, or you're just like a, 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 a vet puppet. Yep. <laughs> a vet merchant. A vet merchant. A Ty Gibson merchant. Yeah, I, I'm, Taj. I'm, I'm, done, I'm Taj. done with this. I'm done with this. Uh, it's also the vibes are so fucking whack, too. It's like, it's just so... It, he's just made everything so whack. Like, it's just depressing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and yeah, the front office isn't perfect. Like, it looks like some of those moves didn't work out. The Noel re-signing, I, I said from the beginning, never re-signed Nerlens Noel. Why? You're going to slander Nerlens on the Sixers podcast? I love Nerlens. I love Nerlens when he's healthy, and I love Nerlens when he's motivated. But when Nerlens has a contract, he's not motivated. Yeah. <laughs> I, he's, like eating, yeah it, he's either hurt or eating hot dogs. Like, that's how it is. Like, that's how he is. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Although I will say, if he if he ever can get healthy, that's a very tradable contract to me. I don't really think that's going to be the one you're stuck with. Because I think yeah. that, like, he can bring value to a team uh, – if he was made available, like I think he could start on some teams, but um, okay. So before we get out of here, you're over Thibs. We we know that. I think he's probably gone after the season, which is wild because he. So William Wesley, shout out to Worldwide West. Everywhere we go, we leave a Worldwide mess. West was uh has been leaking to S and Y that he wants Thibs gone. Yeah, so that that's gonna happen. Basically, we're we're pretty sure that's gonna happen, which is crazy because last time you were on the podcast like a year ago, we were very high on Thibs and, and the Knicks entering a new era. So here we yeah. are a year later and he might be out the door. Let's just talk before you get out of here, the Zion yeah. thing. Okay. Because so here's, the thing, here's the thing about this before, hold on, before you get into it, yeah. I've been hearing about the Zion thing for three since months. He got drafted. But really since he got drafted, low but key. like, yeah, yeah, low key. Like, but like it's been heating up a lot over the last three or four months that like, <laughs> he wants out and like now the reports are coming out and like it's getting weirder and it does feel like he, Zion to the Knicks feels inevitable, but I don't know if it's going to happen sometime in the next year or two, or if he's going to wait until he's on that second contract and then force a trade. We have been hearing about Zion going to the Knicks since Zion was in his rookie season and was like, uh, well, was it, that was like his rookie season was like the beginning of the second season when he was kind of just like, oh, MSG, man, it's a beautiful place. And it's just like, it was the biggest smile Zion's ever done since he left Duke. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, like, everyone's been like, everyone in this land and all over the globe has been like, Zion to the Knicks and RJ, and then now they have Cam Reddish, and it's like this whole thing. Stan, Stan Van Gundy said, and he's kind of right about this, kind of, but not really. That no one actually wants to go to New York anymore. That is true. The only team that can get superstars without being a functional franchise is the Lakers. True. For LA reasons. That they're the only team. But other than that, 
it's not like a like an anti New York thing. It's just like the Knicks aren't that functional. So no one wants to, you know what I mean? Like if the Knicks were a functional organization, they would have Yeah, my team. joke my joke on Twitter was uh, you know, Zion wants out of New Orleans because of uh bad ownership and management and the first team that he wants to go to is the Knicks. Right, like, right. It's weird. It's weird. It doesn't it's make really, any sense. It doesn't make any sense. But like I don't know. I've, I I know Knicks fans who were like, Giants, you you can't bet on a guy like Zion right now. Uh, uh, you know, with his knee. Me personally, I'm betting on Zion. I just I don't know. Me personally, if I have a chance to get Zion Williamson despite his knee issues, I'm gonna try to do it. Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, what else do you have to lose? Like, I, I'm just trying to. Move. Like, that's my thing. Is like. Okay, now if you want to talk about like, I've heard people say like, would Sam Presti trade? Josh Giddy or SGA or some other like some prospect that is like like SGA is probably gonna make all star teams. Like it's it's to the point right. where Shea's like yeah, Shay's good. really good. And I understand that. Like I, I understand like being hesitant to be like, yeah, I don't want to trade this guy. But like if the Knicks are just pretty much just basing it around like the prospects they have plus draft picks, then what do you have to lose really? Like none of those draft picks are gonna be good enough to get you Zion. Mm-hmm. Like unless you're just fully leaning into the tank and you're doing a full process rebuild, which the Knicks seem like they do never want to do. So if that's the case, they're never going to get you someone that could be remotely as good as Zion Williamson was even last year. And like, yeah, maybe the knee thing is real and maybe he's just does or foot or whatever injury he has mm-hmm. is just real and he'll never be the same again. And maybe he'll never play and da 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 blah blah blah. But if you're the Knicks, you're like what the fuck do we give a shit? We haven't had anyone play at the level that Zion played. Like, Zion was shooting 62% from the field and averaging 27 points a game last season. Yeah. Do people forget this? I feel like we have a collective amnesia that like Zion Williamson was one of the best 20-year-olds that we've ever seen a year ago. Yeah. On a bad team, but like he was not the reason that they were bad. Like I'm just like, that talent, like potential talent that you could get there, unless you know his medicals are fucked and he's never going to play or never be the same, then yes, okay, I understand that. But if you were to trade for him, you would get access to his medicals. You exactly. wouldn't trade for him without access to the medical. Also, like, I secretly believe that he, you know, obviously he's hurt, but also like he cl- also clearly does not really want to be in New Orleans. And so he's yeah, kind of just like, yeah. He didn't do his rehabs, dude. Like, I've been hearing about this forever. Like, he didn't do anything. He didn't tell them about the second surgery. Yeah. Like, he doesn't want to be in New Orleans. Like, that's pretty much what it comes down to. I personally think he's been a little bit unprofessional, especially because, like, New Orleans, like, when I got CJ McCollum, like, you know what I mean? Like, Ingram, yeah. CJ McCollum, him, like, Josh Hart, they could be, like, a solid team. They traded Josh Hart for CJ McCollum, but yes. So okay, they traded, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so but they have Herb Jones and, like, uh, Jonas Valanciunas, like they're like they're offensively, they're going to be a very good team. Now, defense, yeah. I don't know, but like, I definitely think that like they're like to me, like I just don't trust any twenty-one-year-old who's like I don't want to live in New Orleans. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Have you ever been to New Orleans? It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you're twenty-one, I went when I was like twenty-four, and I was like, this is the greatest place I've it's ever been. Why well, I yeah, I, I never want to leave. Yeah, Zion, like. Zion seems to be a little bit of a weird guy. I don't know who's like telling him what to do. It seems like maybe he's got like stuff going on with his his family's like in his ear a lot. Yeah. And I don't I don't understand him. But like you have a chance to get Zion Williamson. He's not like amazingly fun to watch, but like it, in my personal opinion, he's not, like incredibly fun to watch. But like he as But a- we don't know. We still don't know. Like we didn't see what he could become. Yeah, I mean, when I was watching him, it was a lot of like I mean, I, I, I mean, he's a terrific player, and he's, in he, athletically, he's a freak. But like, it wasn't as fun to watch as watch him at, watching him at Duke. There's something about him that's like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He was way more explosive at Duke. Yeah, and also a lot of it is like when you're playing with other NBA players who are also athletic, it's the same shit. So yeah, it's like whatever. But like, it's kind of Cam Reddish's problem too, where it's like Cam was like this freak athlete until he got to the NBA, and now it's like he's still like a good athlete, but he's not like compared to other NBA players. It's like it, it levels out a little bit. Like you're not like the guy anymore. You know, in high school cam was like, Hey, I had never seen anything like him watching some of that footage. 
And even you ask Anthony Edwards, Tyrese Maxey, all those guys, they, they'll say the same thing about Cam Reddish. But, yeah. um, but it's funny because, like, my thing with the Zion thing is, like, and I said it before, like, we just saw what happened with Ben Simmons. We've seen what's happened with James Harden twice in two seasons now. We've seen what happened with Kyrie Irving. We've seen what happened with Ka- Kawhi Leonard. Like, stars get where they want to go. That's mm. just the reality of the NBA now. And his his situation is a little bit unique because of the qualifying offer thing that could happen in a year because he hasn't even started his second contract. But, like, Zion to the Knicks, if he really wants to go there, that's his number one team. It's just a matter of time whether he gets there or not, unless they have another lockout and the owners are like, we're not, this isn't happening anymore, basically. Right. Right. That's the only scenario, I think, where like Zion doesn't somehow end up on the Knicks or there's, there's a lot of question marks with him because of the, I mean, who knows if we have no idea if it's, we have, we have no idea if it's likewise, the Knicks are thinking they want him or if he's even, he's even come out and said he's like asked for a trade or whatever. But it does look like he does love Madison Square Garden. Like, that was, like, Jenny Whip type of thing. And it's been, like, in the whispers for a while. I would love Zion Williamson. I would. Do you, th- do you not think that getting Cam? Zion Williamson? Huh? Getting Cam was not, like. I mean, I know that they weren't, uh, like, the I think closest. There's other reasons to get, I think there's other reasons to get Cam Reddish other than Zion Williamson. But, yeah, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. To have, like, two guys that he played with in college. Yeah, and, it and, you know, and Reddish is a really fluid player. I don't. I don't buy it. I don't buy it yet. But what he is really good at is he's a really fluid player. We don't have a lot of guys who are like fluid in that type of way with their bodies. I think Cam Reddish could be a really good role player. That's that's been my whole thing. It's like I think Cam can shoot off the catch. He's fluid enough to yeah, like to yeah. like attack closeouts and do like things off ball and like be a little bit of a force defensively yeah. at times and like be a good on ball guy and stuff. But like he thinks he's a superstar, unfortunately. That's the issue. That yeah. is the issue. That's is that always been his thing? Even at Duke, yeah. it was his thing. Like in high school, it was his thing. Yeah, exactly. If Cam buys into a role, I could see him being an effective NBA player. My thing is just like. Cam wants to be the dude. And, like, I don't blame him. Like, I, Jeremy Grant's doing the same thing right now. Like, like some guys are just, like, f- like, and I talk about this with, like, uh, John Collins and Tobias Harris. Like, you know, like I said, like, John Collins is obviously better than Tobias because to- J- John Collins fills a role that he can catch lobs, he can shoot off the catch, he can play d- a good help defense, whatever. Well, he bought into a role. But now he's got to the point where he's so good that he's like, I want the ball more. And that's what happens when guys are really talented players is that eventually they just get to the point where they're like, I want to be the dude. And like you get Tobias Harris syndrome, which is that you yeah. can't be a role player basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. So yeah. Uh, please stop. Please stop. All we need him to do. All we need him to do is take five or six catch and shoot threes a game. Like he has been sh- make him at third. Okay. But, but what's so insane to me about it is that like, I'm just going to end on this note is that, it's not even like out of the realm of possibility that this could happen because he's done it before. Like he shot five threes a game with the Clippers and the Sixers when he first got here. And he made, he made like 38 to 42% of them. And all of a sudden he just doesn't want to do it. Yeah. Tobias is weird. He shot well from three in his career. It's just that like, he's just like, yeah, he's a weird player. I just wish, I wish he could just be like, Trevor Ariza like I just want him to be like a guy who shoots threes and plays competitive defense and like tries his ass off like I don't like old Trevor Ariza obviously like I don't want him to be I don't want him to be the guy who he thinks he is and once again this is the last opportunity that Tobias Harris will have with the Sixers if he doesn't buy into this role and the Sixers flame out in the playoffs he's gone this offseason they'll use everything they have left to get off the contract and open up other shit but Jason Thank you for coming on. I had a great time talking with you about the Sixers and the Knicks and all that shit. You know where to find Jason. I'll put his uh, Twitter in the description, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Peace. My man.